much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to call this meeting to order of the mayor and commissioners for March the 10th, 2015. Can you all rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can I get the roll call, please? Commissioner Walker? Here. Commissioner Alfred? Here. Commissioner Scully? Commissioner Warnick? Here. Commissioner Scully is absent. Thank you. I'm actually going to change our prayer tonight um, to a brief moment of silence. Uh, Commissioner Scully, is, uh, her son is actually very ill. Um, he is in the hospital. Um, he has been there for the past few days, um, and he is also going to require some at-home care once he is out of the hospital. Um, so I know on behalf of the board and on behalf of the town, our thoughts and prayers are with uh, Tom and Jen um, tonight. So if we could have a brief moment of silence uh, and, uh, and, and our thoughts be with Jen and her son, uh, I would love that. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get the approval of minutes for the February 10th, 2015 town meeting? Move we approve the minutes. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Thank you. A reporting of an executive session from February the 18th, 2015. Town administrator, do you have that? Yes, I do, Mayor. On February 18th, 2015, at 4 p.m. on the third floor of the town hall, the mayor and commissioners met in executive session as provided for under the Maryland Open Meetings Act. A motion to open the meeting was made by Commissioner Scully, seconded by Commissioner Warnick. Uh, the vote passed 4 to 0, and all elected officials were present. A motion to hold an executive session was made by Commissioner Walker and seconded by uh, Commissioner Warnick, the motion passed four to zero. The reason for the executive session as provided for under the <clears throat> Maryland Open Meetings Act was for item number eight, to consult with staff consultants or other individuals about pending or potential litigation, and item number 14, before a contract is awarded or bids are open, discuss a matter directly related to a negotiating strategy or the contents of a bid or a proposal, a public discussion or disclosure would adversely impact the ability of the public body to participate in the competitive bidding or proposal process. Um, the topics discussed, uh, Jay Gullo um, was going to be dis uh, giving us an update on the uh, Chester Water Project. Joe Mason from Davenport and Associates uh, was also giving us an update on the financial aspects of the <coughs> Chester Water and Mitch Coney was giving us an update on the legal issues involving Howard Ropeson and the sewer plant. Persons present at the meeting in addition to the elected body was Jay Gullo, the town attorney, Mitch Coney, the sewer plant attorney, Joe Mason from Davenport and Associates, and Calvin A. Bonnenberger, Jr., town administrator, and Marsha Spencer, town clerk. Actions taken at the meeting was, uh, given the sensitivity of the issues, a motion was made by Commissioner Warnick, seconded by Commissioner Scully, to seal the minutes of the meeting as permitted by law. That motion passed four to zero. A motion was made by Commissioner Walker, mm -hmm. seconded by Commissioner Warnick, to leave executive session. That passed four to zero. A motion was made by Commissioner Arthurneath, seconded by Commissioner Warnick, to adjourn the meeting. That passed four to zero, and the meeting was adjourned at six thirty-eight p.m. Thank you. We have no public presentations tonight, and we also have no business meeting items. So, can I get the citizens' input, please? Thank you. 
We have no speakers on the agenda this evening. Would anyone else like to speak? <laughs> Hearing none, we'll move forward. I'm going to go ahead and skip over the mayor's report. Uh, I think that's something I'm probably going to move uh, the staff reports uh, going forward. We'll move that ahead um, of the mayor's report. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let the town financials. Thank you. You're going to see that you have two months, January, and we're just going to skip over January and go right to February, which is behind the red tab and uh, I'm just sorry I'm just gonna do the highlights because I am starting to get a cold and I know I'm getting ready to lose my voice so um, in the month of February in the month of January we actually if you go back to January later on you'll see that we got all the do to do froms cleaned up and then we had to pay some sewer bills and then we had to borrow from everywhere to get those paid um, in the month of February but then we got some money later on so basically the total assets are about a half a million and if you go to the next page you will see that we are in the positive a hundred and ninety six thousand nine hundred and thirty five dollars and ninety one cents if you go to the budget to actual, which is the very last page in the governmental, you will see that we are very close to being right on um, budget to actual with the revenue. We're only 15,000 below, and that's probably more a timing issue. So, um, but expenses are 59,000 less than what we had budgeted. So we are positive. Um, well, basically, you'll see that we were predicting to have a positive of 195,000, and we actually had 196, because what we did was we were planning on taking out more debt of 43,000, and we didn't do that because we kept the expenses under. We basically used our own money to finance the expenditures. Any questions with the governmental? Okay, let's go to the proprietary. Patricia, if you give me one second for this. Okay. And I'm, I'm doing something different, trying to make the font a little bit larger so the audience can see, but it makes it a little difficult to scroll, scroll around. Okay, I'm with you. So the government really hadn't changed a lot, but what I really wanted to point out in the proprietary, you will see that cash and cash equivalent is $1,412,221.06. And, and the reason is, is we got some grant money for the sewer project of $946,323. Our goal is eventually to move some of that into the MLGIP, but <clears throat> Every time we turn around, we're paying bills out way before we're going to get the money from MDE. So we've kind of left that buffer there so that we're not, before we kept borrowing money from the government and we're trying to get that money paid back to the government. So right now, what we owe to the government is um, $13,141.80. So we've brought that down significantly compared to the prior months. Now the water, the government owes the water $122,053.78, but we're hoping by the end of the year that we can get that paid out. But we did have extra expenses with the um, parks and with um, the streets where we didn't borrow the money. That kind of put a stress on, on the cash flow with the government. So, um, but that's the big change that's happened in the proprietary fund. If you go to the very last page, you will see budget to actual, we're only different by $1,631.71. And we have spent less than what we are planning, $221,530.57. If you go farther down under other revenue, 
you will see the intergovernment from the state, and that's where you see the $946,323 that um, has, you know, really helped us out with cash flow-wise. Any questions? And I believe, according to Mandy, she said another 2000 240 or something. Yeah, came okay. from, just came, in. just came in. So that's going to even improve that number more. What's the <clears throat> The MLGIP is the money that's in the PNC. It's our investment account. About an investment. That's what I thought. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, just to let you all know, I won't be here in April. Um, as soon as tax season's over, I'm going to be having some surgery. So I probably won't be available for two weeks. But, you know, Mandy has been cross-trained. If you all have any questions, feel free to give her a call. She pretty well does 90% of these financial statements at this point. Okay, and her last name is Gurton. Thank you. Uh, please keep us updated, too, with your surgery as well. Oh, thank you. I'm going to leave early. You're good. No worries. <laughs> Mayor? Yes? On this report, there's a couple of things I'd, I'd like to shed a little bit more light on because people who might have watched didn't see the video the last time when we talked about what these do to farms. I, I don't I want to curb off any idea that we've borrowed money because we're not making enough money. I want to reiterate that it's because of the grant money that we get from MDE, we have to pay that money out first and get reimbursed. And so if you look on that page three where it talks about, um, you know, we're talking big numbers here where um, the water and the sewer owe each other a lot of money. That is specifically, as Patricia Wagner said, we had to pay $946,000 out of our reserve funds. We had to borrow that money from the various operating funds that we have, and then once MDE paid us back, that will all be repopulated again. So I don't want to. I don't want to send the impression out there on, on uh, through the video that. We're, we're staying afloat because we're borrowing money or something like that. It, it's money that's owed us. We're spending the money first and then waiting to get reimbursed. It's, it's worth noting that all Maryland financial policy is, their, their financial policy for the state of Maryland is money owed to municipalities has to be paid out by the municipality yes. first and then reimburse. That's yes. how all grants are administered. And then the other thing is Patricia Wagner, you know, correctly highlighted um, when we were finishing up the streets and sidewalks a year ago under Commissioner Walker, we had budgeted to go borrow more money, and we did not borrow that money. We tightened our belts here and did it in-house. And so when we talk about putting a stress on it, it's actually we, we spent the money we had to spend without going and borrowing more money and taking a greater debt load in the future. So. Thank you. Yep. Chief? I'll go through this quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Share. Right. You can share with a Jane. Oh, it's, it's the Cecil. What's the Cecil Howell? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. Um, first off, in the packet I gave you, the stats for this uh, past two-week period shows we've had 200 calls for service. Um, most notable in that, in the top 10 percent, you will see a code number 26. That is drug arrest. Um, within the last two weeks, we've had seven drug arrests, um, and it serves, it shows that uh, the guys are being aggressive. The top 12 codes that you see in that list are officer-generated, officer-initiated. Um, with the highest being patrol checks. Uh, it's a code 71, and it's in the second or third page that you're looking at. Um, again, number 26 is a 
drug arrest. Um, our guys are extremely proactive. They're getting out there, getting things done. And what you'll find in that also, all the other codes represent other crimes. They're starting to reduce because of the drug arrest that we're making and those people that are involved, the number of other crimes are starting to drop off. And let's hope that we can keep it that way um, and keep the, uh, those that are involved in that type of activity out of town. Um, I had the privilege to speak at the uh, Cecil College for the Black History Month Multicultural um, Student Union Program. The program was geared towards the uh, incidents that occurred in New York and in Ferguson, Missouri, and also in Florida. There were a lot of misconceptions um, by those that attended, and we were able to clear a lot of that up just by having an open dialogue. So with that, um, I would say it's a great opportunity to learn if you would like to meet your law enforcement executives around the county, get out, talk to them, you'll find that a lot of things that you may believe, a lot of uh, misinformation you may have received um, via the press, via social media, can be cleared up just in a, a brief conversation with your law enforcement officers and your law enforcement executives. Next, the body camera program. At the last meeting, I spoke with you all about body <coughs> cameras. I gave you one of the estimates that we received. Um, I'm not comfortable with a portion of that, and it's still up for some uh, um, debate with Taser. Uh, I think the numbers they gave us are a little um, high. high. I was going to say ridiculous, but I'll yeah. leave it at high. Um, so we're still debating that. Also, and I've had this conversation prior to uh, the meeting, in Annapolis they're going through the body cameras program also for some of the larger uh, jurisdictions. There's several questions that came about. Um, before the town jumps into this, I would like to see how they play out. I don't want to propel us right into some type of legal uh, liability with our program. I know there's other jurisdictions that are successful um, down around the D.C. Beltway. However, there has been some major questions raised. Um, I, I know we can overcome. Excuse me. <laughs> I know our policies and procedures would, would normally overcome those uh, those questions, but I, again, I don't want to see the town propelled into some type of liable situation with, you know, the program at this point. Um, the hiring process. Uh, the the dates closed. We've gotten several applications. Um, I'm in the process of going through to make sure that those that have been submitted meet the criteria that was set in the advertisement. Um, and once we get that portion done, we'll convene a board to dwindle down the uh, those suitable candidates to the one that we want. Okay. Um, from what I've seen so far, I think we've got some very, very qualified people, um, very good people that have applied, and uh, many of them are local. And lastly, uh, the ballistic vest had a life expectancy. Right now we have a few that are nearing that replacement time. Um, the Governor's Office on Crime Control and Prevention <clears throat> is offering a grant that matches a 50% match of uh, what the cost would be. So I'm in the process of writing that grant to see if we could get that 50%, which is, I can't say 100% guaranteed, um, but it's something that we've done in the past um, to help reduce the cost of replacing the vest. At this time, it's approximately three vest um, that we're looking at replacing. Um, the cost would be you know, roughly uh, $2,500 for three. And with that being said, that's my report, um, unless there's any questions. Chief. Yes, sir. 
with all the, 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 the high number of the drug-related crimes, what, what kind of are we seeing? Are we seeing uh, possession or trafficking using the town of Rising Sun as a transfer Chris? point? Well, it, it's tough. Um, we're seeing large quantities. And what we're finding is a lot of people are what we call middle manning, middling. Um, they are buying large quantities, selling them at a higher rate than what they bought them, and also using. So we're getting uh, pretty significant size quantities of, of seizures. What, t what type of? Heroin is the main, you know, yeah. drug we're getting. Of. Heroin is the main drug we get. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you all Thank very you much. Chief. Town Administrator, do you have a report this evening? No report. No report? No report. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Historical Preservation Commission, do you have a report? I'll make it as brief as I possibly can. Uh, this afternoon I had four guests in to uh, tour the museum. Uh, they had called for an appointment and I made the appointment and it was quite interesting. They all four were re former residents of Rising Sun. Tomorrow evening at our regular scheduled meeting, we have two speakers and I would encourage everyone to attend. There are two Rising Sun residents, two elderly Rising Sun residents. Uh, one of them is 92 years old. And they're going to tell us, give us a talk on their lives and how it was in Rising Sun. They both are pretty much lifetime residents. One was born here and the other one uh, came when she was still young uh, from Indiana. So you might want to attend it. it. I expect it will learn something that we didn't know. George, are you speaking tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> oh. not, not quite 92 yet. <laughs> you want to roll over and <laughs> smack him with your cane? It was right. terrible. Get him later. Smack him with your cane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, him later. I want to encourage everybody. We have another scheduled event that's going to take place this Saturday. Am I correct, Jane? It's called Cabin Fever, and we are going to be in attendance as well as, I understand, representation from the commissioners and from the Arts Council. So we're going to be well represented. Uh, we're going to have some giveaways for the children, and uh, you might want to stop by, uh, buy a soda or something, and see what they're offering. Give the time, Jane. What time is it? 11 to 2. Here? No. Oh. It's over at uh, Moore's, Chapel. Moore's Chapel Church. And that's it, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Moving into my report, it is pretty brief this evening. Um, I wanted to give a huge thank you. Uh, I know that um, Commissioner Rath will probably uh, say this as well. A huge thank you to our Public Works crew. They have worked um, their butts off to uh, fix a bunch of um, issues that we've had with water leaks recently and then on top of that we got a major snowstorm so uh, we want to say uh, a big thank you to them for all the hard work that they do for us um, I also wanted to say that I am working hard on uh, an events calendar still that I'm trying to wrap up by the end of this week uh, that'll include all of the events that we're going to be doing this year um, so that we'll be able to have them here and, and uh, on social media as well as on our website so residents can know what's going on throughout the year and be able to plan ahead. Um, so that's going to give them plenty of time to be able to, to come and enjoy events here in our town. Uh, I did want to say uh, I've been working along with Chief Peterson as well as Commissioner Scully. I'm not going to go into um, a good portion of it because Commissioner Scully isn't here, uh, but we've been, I approached them both about working on an initiative for uh, texting while driving. Um, so we're going to be doing an initiative here um, starting soon um, for texting and driving um, and bringing awareness um, that it is illegal here in the state of Maryland. Um, and a lot of uh, youth uh, 
are guilty. I know myself, I've been guilty in the past of answering a text message while driving. Um, so we want to bring awareness to that. Got that. Um, and I think that that's very important. <clears throat> Within town limits. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, <take me> <laughs> uh, I did want to say this Friday, uh, I will be attending uh, a, a Cecil County Young Life uh, event. Um, Cecil County Young Life has asked me to come and they're debating whether or not they are going to pie me in the face or dunk me in a dunk tank. Um, so uh, no uh, older people are welcome to come. It's just for kids. So <laughs> don't get any ideas about attending. Um, but I am excited to be there and um, lend a hand, I guess, to them. So with that being said, we'll move into any old business this evening. Any new business? Our commissioner's comments. Uh, Commissioner Authenreath. Uh, Mr. Mayor, let, let me go last. I have quite a bit to okay. in, inform the public about tonight. Uh, Commissioner Walker. The uh, sewer construction is proceeding nicely. Any problems that have arisen have been very efficiently and quickly solved by the uh, engineer and the contractor. Uh, we've also done a little work on the water line. Uh, everything seems to be moving along very well. And I did want to mention uh, a thank you to you. You traveled all the way to, uh, <clears throat> was it Harrisburg that you attended uh, a, a water line meeting? So uh, thank you for all your hard work that you do with that. I would also like to compliment the, the maintenance department, all the employees for the work that they put in over the last uh, couple of weeks with the many water line breaks we had and with the uh, snowstorm and snow removal. They, they worked long hours <clears throat> and uh, did a very good job. Yeah. Commissioner Warnick. Yeah, the, uh, currently with the Parks and Rec, there's not a whole lot um, uh, going on out in the field per se, but we had uh, a meeting today with uh, Octa Rare Watershed with uh, Rupert Rossetti and um, I can't Center think of Center for the, Watershed Protection. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Of Brian. Not, yeah, it was Brian. Okay, I was going to say Eric, but it, I knew it was Eric. Um, anyway, we... Uh, are moving forward with uh, um, trying to get a couple projects going uh, that would help reduce, it, it would have a number of benefits um, for the town, uh, for the residents of the town, as well as uh, it would help clean up Chesapeake Bay a little bit. Um, the primary benefits to the town residents would be less flooding at the park, which would mean less days a year that the uh, playground would be inaccessible and that the park would be um, you know, unusable. And uh, we would also have less flooding over Hopewell Road, or I guess, I don't know if that's Hopewell or Wilson, right there it changes names, I'm not exactly sure where the bridge is. But uh, the, right there we're at the entrance to the cemetery, you would hopefully have less flooding at that, <coughs> excuse me, at that bridge. Um, so the road would be, and also at 273. Um, so those would be good things for the town residents. There'd be uh, a number of, when I mean, we have really bad rainstorms, there's a number of entrances to town that are um, flooded out and we'd hopefully uh, eliminate at least two of those flood areas or at least minimize the two flood areas um, so we're uh, working with the county to try and move forward on on that project so and uh, with a lot of other organizations um, there's a project stream cleanup uh, it'll be April 24th from 9 a.m. to noon so we're uh, we're gonna be cleaning up uh, at Veterans Park there's I guess throughout the years there's been a lot of uh, debris that's accumulated back in the woods and uh, we're going to work on trying to get some of that cleaned up and and uh, you know, clean up that wooded area some. Um, and uh, I believe that's all I have. And I guess as uh, Mr. Mummy alluded to, uh, we'll be at the uh, cabin fever this weekend. Um, while well, I'm thinking about tomorrow night, uh, the videotaping. I have a Sunfest meeting beforehand, so I'll try and make it here by seven for that. So, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Authenreath. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to go up to the podium and speak so that uh, it can go into the microphone. And Calvin's got some pictures we want to put up as we explain some of this stuff. All right, what, what I want to report on tonight uh, is now that we're getting close to the weather breaking, 
Um, we've had quite a few things happen over the winter uh, that have kept our public works guys very busy. Uh, once again, not to, to sound ridiculous, we this town really owes a great deal of thanks to uh, Ron Thomas, Chris George, Daryl Bader, and Grant Coates, who have been working long hours out in the cold, the snow, the rain, the mud, you name it. Uh, these guys have put in a lot of long hours jumping from water mains to snow plowing to salting to shoveling. Um, superhuman work and we owe them a great deal of thanks and if you see them in your community doing something one thing you need to know is these gentlemen when they get on the job when we have a water or a weather event snow what have you they're going to stay there until it's done uh, they work on it just like they're working on their own homes they don't stop when the clock and punch the clock and leave the job they stay there and work tirelessly uh, to finish the job and We've had some inconveniences with water outages over the past few months, but they are very insignificant compared to what other communities have gone through. Uh, some places have been without water in areas for weeks, and our guys get stay on the job and get it back together uh, very quickly. So we owe them uh, a big, big uh, thank you for the work they do. and. With all the work that they've been doing, one of the things we wanted to run down tonight is uh, a big job that just happened up on Ryan Drive, as well as the two water main uh, leaks we had out here right in front of Town Hall, uh, which uh, were due to age, you know, the weather, and standing out there with those gentlemen when we were work when they were working on that and had that ground dug up, some of the large trucks that came through, you could feel shaking the road out there and, and it's no wonder why pipes right out here in the intersection uh, break crack the way they did uh, i know there was nights calvin was on the phone tracking down uh, clamps that we needed when because everybody was running out because everybody's having these water issues driving as far as philadelphia to pick up parts we needed while these guys stayed on the job and dug so <clears throat> most recently when we had uh before the snowstorm was at the top of the hill on Ryan Drive. As you can see, Calvin's got a, a picture up here. And the white line, is that our water line, Calvin, coming through there? Yeah. yeah. Through the center of the road? Commissioner Arthur, let me say the, the pins that I had put on the computer downstairs did not okay. copy up to here, so we'll have to be more okay. descriptive. Well, we can be a little more descriptive. Yeah. Um, bottom line, we had, we had water start bubbling up through the road up the top of the hill there, Ryan Drive on the cul-de-sac. Uh, whenever you get something like that, the water leak is not necessarily right under where the water bubbles out of the road. So the guys had to get in there, along with our contractor that does a lot of work for us, James Meadows, who, uh, you know, is always is right there when we need him. They had to go in there and start digging holes to find where the leak was coming from. And as they started digging down, one of the things they found uh, right off the bat was the road surface. This road hadn't been laid on the proper surface and I'll, I'll come back to that here you go i'm up to you now yeah as you can see well we got about two inches of asphalt right on top of just clay no stone bedding as it should be so as this water started <clears throat> coming up through the dirt it just undermined you know it dug tunnels basically left big voids where the water sought out the easiest place to travel from where the leak was and come up through the road what Calvin's got up on the picture there now is showing the service connections. What they found once they got into the ground uh, was a service connection where the clamp that holds the service connection to the PVC pipe had basically its life expectancy failed prematurely. It was a poor quality of clamp. As you can see, he's holding it there where it just it broke off. Uh, part of what led to that was you have a galvanized steel clamp around a PVC pipe. You have weather like this, you have the contraction and then the expansion of the pipes and it found the weakest link and broke it. So once they started you know, working on this, they found the one, as you see, is holding there, put it back together, installed a new clamp on it, put the water pressure back in the line and another one popped. 
make a long story short, seven connections on that pipe in that cul-de-sac at the top of Ryan Drive uh, broke f due to, from what we saw, it was a poor quality of a clamp. Something that should have lasted 30 plus years failed in approximately 25. Another thing that we found while they were in there is we've got a pipe that is very, you know, it's got some what should have been its life left, but it's not. Uh, it's, it's, it's starting to fail. Um, seven connections were repaired. What we're going to do, we've discussed it, is we're going to come back into the cul-de-sac, and there's five connections, as you see Calvin's mouse going around that circle there, that I call them may pops. They may pop tonight, tomorrow, but they're going to break very soon. So for the residents that live in up in that community, you know, as they got, as our town guys got those water connections fixed, boom, they had to stop and go plow snow. <laughs> so we're coming back to that area. What we're going to do is, is go in and those other five connections, and there is a total of 80, 85 connections on that Sunrise Estates water lines coming up through there. But we're going to come back, and since that road is already tore up, go ahead and replace the other five connections so that they don't surprise us in the middle of the night with another water leak, because, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to happen. So another thing, and I won't call this a blessing in disguise, but we found a lot of problems with that road when they dug it up. Not only was the asphalt on top laid on a bed of dirt with no support, which made that road look like a washboard up there. We also found that the pipe was not laid on the proper bedding of stone and secured. So this pipe's laying there in the dirt, water going through it, moving side to side, back and forth, creating a void around it. Once you create a void, weight on top of it, it's going to come down. Uh, so that, that whole road has been a big focus of our, our thought here lately. We still have KCI going through the town, and I think before the, the big snow hit a couple of weeks ago that Saturday, they had hit 70% of the roads in town to start their evaluation. Uh, now that the, the snow is melting off, and hopefully we won't get another one, they'll be back to finish that evaluation. But we also, Calvin had them come out and look at this road and started looking at the infrastructure that was there and what we could do. Now, another thing we want to do, we don't want to throw good money after bad, just go in there and fix those connections and come in and pave that road quickly. We asked the residents to, to, you know, bear with us for a little while so we can fix that area right. There's a good possibility we're going to go ahead and replace that PVC pipe with, uh, duct, what was it called, Calvin? Ductile, ductile iron. Ductile ductile iron. iron. And since we're going to go in there and replace those connections, we were very seriously considering since the road's all dug up, we've already replaced seven connections, getting ready to do five more. Right on that bend at the top of Ryan Drive, we're going to dig some inspection holes there, right around, if you can see where Calvin's mouse is circling around. Uh, where that pipe comes up the hill and angles, one of the things I was taught is that when you have a high flow of water coming through that pipe and then it has to make a couple of turns, it's going to push that pipe around. So we want to see if they put the proper buttresses in to support that pipe. We want to see if that, uh, that section is showing any premature failure signs. And if it is, what we're going to do is go ahead and put new pipe down through there. We're going to have new connections to the homes proper bedding under that pipe, proper bedding between the dirt and the road surface, which is going to require us to go in there and do some excavating and dig that out so that that job is done right. It's going to take a little more time. It's going to take a little more money, but it's better than paying it, doing it twice. We want to do it once the first time and do it right. And part of the problem that we're having to do this now is because it wasn't done right the first time. Uh, it was done to me, cheaply, you know, the proper stone wasn't put in for the bed of the pipe. The proper stone uh, bedding wasn't laid down for the asphalt. And if you look back at 
that whole development, we may have a big problem there. And unfortunately, the town of Rising Sun today and the, those residents of us living here today are going to be the ones stuck dealing with it because of what a developer didn't do uh, in the early days of creating this development. And we're starting to see a pattern with this type of developer. Uh, down in Keppel's Mill, we found a pipe that crushed, caved in, that also didn't have the proper bedding put around it and support, and allowed a pipe that wasn't very old to collapse. This was fortunately a stormwater drain, and it didn't cause any uh, cutoff of water service to anybody, but it created a very unsafe situation, a very expensive repair, once again, for the current uh, residents of the town of Rising Sun and Keppel's Mill. And if you follow that back, it has a connection to Ryan Drive, it is the same developer. And if you look at a couple other uh, issues that we're having in some of the uh, local fairly new developments, if you follow the trail of what's happening out here as it funnels down, it all seems to funnel down to the same source. And it's quite upsetting. It, it really, <laughs> I can't say the word what it does, but it really upsets me. And it upsets this whole board and should upset every resident uh, in this town because we've been taken advantage of. And it's not fair. It's not right. And we're not going to put up with this kind of stuff. We're not going to come back in and fix it as cheap as possible. We're going to go in and we're going to fix it right. Um, one of the things that, let me just run down a few notes here to you just to make sure I've gotten off track. <clears throat> um, like I said, the, the failure up in that, that Ryan Drive was mostly not as much old line breaking due to weather uh, related issues like we get so many times in the winter time. That's when we always seem to get our water main breaks. But this one was uh, a poor quality product installed. And a lot of people were without water. And if you go up on Ryan Drive now, it's a real mess. There's a lot of dirt and stone and everything up there. And I want to assure the residents of that community, uh, we're going to get in there, get that stone and dirt out of there, and clean that area up now that the weather seems to be breaking. And, and hopefully it won't turn into a mud hole and we won't get a lot of rain. And Ron and his guys can get up there and do some work and clean that area up. But like I said, be, be patient with us, residents of Ryan Drive. We want to fix this area right. We don't want you to have, you know, in, in a few short years, another water problem because we just came in and, and, and fixed it to be fixing it as cheap as possible. Uh, it's not going to be cheap. It's going to cost some money. Uh, we may wind up doing the whole uh, area of Ryan Drive and Sunrise Circle, which could be upwards of approximately – Two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars. Now, one of the things um, that Calvin's been working on a lot of hours, a lot of weekends, is some grant applications, and he's added this uh, into it because this, you know, five hundred thousand dollars. We don't have that kind of money laying around to fix somebody else's cheap, shoddy work that they did, that they've already gotten paid for, and th that's a crime. So we we have also been looking into some legal action. Uh, to protect the residents and to reduce the amount of money that's going to come out of our bank account to repair this kind of thing. So what are we doing to prevent this in the future? Uh, it's, it's hard to prevent a, a water leak. It, things are going to happen. You take a pipe and some steel and copper and you bury it in the ground, uh, things are going to happen. Same way with a lot of electric wires that are put in the ground. We could have uh, sewer pipes in that area getting ready to fail. We could have stormwater pipes under that ground getting ready to fail. Uh, those things we can work with a little, the stormwater we can deal with. But uh, somebody not having water in their house, that's, that's really tough to live with. So one of the things we've been doing, uh, the Planning and Zoning Board have been doing, is working on new land development codes, uh, adequate public facilities ordinances, and make sure that when the developers come in, and they want to develop uh, our precious land here in this town that they're going to there's going to be hurdles for them for lack of a better word we're putting new uh codes into place because of things like this that have happened to make sure that 
Bonds are placed to the side and held so that if this kind of work fails prematurely, the person who did the bad work will have to pay for it. We're going through an issue like this right now with Brian's Grace, a fairly new development with a lot of unfinished work, uh, a lot of shoddy workmanship, and we're working with uh, Cecil Bank to secure funds that they still hold uh, to pay for this work without it coming out of the Town of Rising Sun's bank account. Um, another thing that uh, we've done uh, over the winter that uh, we've had a lot of problems and a lot of complaints about is snow removal. Uh, the town actually had to go out and remove snow from seven properties, which were a combination of uh, bank-owned properties that are vacant, that nobody lives in, but still the access uh, to sidewalks and stuff were blocked. Uh, we had about 10 warnings sent out to residents that live there, as well as some bank-owned properties, <clears throat> that if we come in and remove it, that we will be billing them, and it's quite high. It's not cheap for us to come in and do this stuff. Uh, we're not going to take it on the chin. So, Calvin, if there's anything I've kind of left out there that you want to point out, please jump in there. One thing I want to say before I forget about it, uh, the plan back to the Planning and Zoning Board. We haven't met in a couple of months due to weather issues. Uh, the holiday uh, that we had in uh, January, uh, also February. But our next meeting's March the 16th. We're hoping that the weather will be good um, and we can all get together again. We haven't seen each other in a while and get back to finishing up uh, a ordinance that we've been working on for almost a year now that's been quite lengthy but is going to protect this town going forward as uh, new communities try to be built. And we've got some uh, new stores coming into town. We've got a big property in town that uh, is on the very positive verge of purchase and uh, has thoughts of doing some type of development. But we're really working hard to protect the town going forward, to protect each other. <clears throat> Uh, when something like this happens, it, it, it hits me, Dave, Travis, Jen, George, everybody's uh, budget also. We're not immune to it. Uh, when this kind of thing happens to Ryan Drive, it affects all of us, not just those residents in Ryan Drive. So to the Ryan Drive residents, we haven't forgot about you. They're going to be back up. Uh, it's going to be an, a bit of an inconvenience, but you're going to love the finished product later on this summer when we have a chance to get back in there and do this job right. Calvin, anything else? Um, two, two things I, I'm suggesting we circle back to is um, the picture that I'm showing here is the actual fittings that are in place up there now. The only thing, that, not what we put in, this is what was originally installed. So you can see that all this is is a PVC pipe that has a hole bored into it. And then this fitting that we looked at previously here is what goes around that pipe. And there are hose clamps. I, I call them radiator clamps. Imagine a radiator clamp on your car that wraps around the pipe. Those are what were failing. And what the clamps should look like is essentially like that. Yeah, I mean, a layperson can look at that and see how much better quality that clamp is than what was put up there. I mean, that's the, the main pipe itself is going to be defective before those clamps fail up there. The other thing that I wanted to double back on, too, is uh, the echo on what you were talking about changing land development codes and what we've been doing, the mayor's been pushing property maintenance and stuff like that. This is why the town has been evolving over the last couple of years because, it, you know, all these chickens are coming home to roost now with some of the stuff that happened over the years. But here's another interesting thing is some people might remember in the past the back and forth between the town of Rising Sun hasn't taken dedication on some of these developments. We haven't taken dedication on Maple Heights. We haven't taken dedication on Brian's Grace because we had enough information in the last couple of years to realize those, those projects were not done properly. And when we talk about escrow funds, we're talking in the case of Brian's Grace, there's about $492,000 of money 
being held as a security by Cecil Bank for Brian's Grace. The developer has been trying to get us to take dedication of that development to release so he could get that escrow fund released. We are refusing to do it because we have questions about the way the development was done and the fact that the developer will not provide us certain information that we need. For instance, uh, the mayor and, and the commissioners, you realize how our guys were up there. Basically, they might as well have had a fourth stick there mm -hmm. trying to find the water source up there because there were no as-built drawings that they could rely on. So a lot of the holes were created because they were eyeing up property lines and saying, well, okay, I think the water line comes out to here, but it didn't come out to there. And so for the residents in Brian's <coughs> Grace, when you hear us talking about we want as-built drawings from the developer, that's the reason why. The second thing that's happened, in, and I'll throw this out here, you said that we've been talking to Cecil Bank. One of the problems we had was in July of 2014, Cecil Bank decided that they could not understand why the town was not taking dedication on Brian's Grace, and they did their own little tour of their bank executives, and they decided to release the developer from those funds. And then basically told us, hey, you took too long, we release the funds. We're the position that legally they cannot do that. We've been trying to negotiate with them politely over this. We've tried to tell them that, you know, we don't anticipate needing the full 400 some odd thousand dollars. We just need roughly a hundred thousand dollars because we in good faith went and had our engineer go out and estimate what would need to be done for as-built drawings to fix some things that are bad, all the things the developer should have been doing that that escrow fund would protect us from, the developer has not been doing it. So, you know, this elected body has dug its heels in on the way business used to be done and has said we're not doing it anymore. And anyone who wonders why we are doing these things, just take a ride up on Ryan Drive and look at the Swiss <coughs> cheese that's up there. I mean, we're to the point we've had to advise the fire company. I see Mr. Funk here. We advise the fire company to avoid running heavy trucks into that cul-de-sac if they can avoid it. By all means, if there's a fire, they're going to be up there. They're going to do their job. And it's not something that's going to be catastrophic where they're going to fall to the center of the, the earth or something here. But we don't need, you know, trucks sinking into the cabin at all kinds, basically a Chinese fire drill while they're trying to fight a fire they're dealing with some other issue of potholes and cave and cavings and stuff like that so this has a real domino effect and I will say on behalf of the board it's really frustrating that Cecil Bank would take the attitude of ah, you don't need the money and release and try and try that's the key try to release that money right. so that puts <clears throat> in perspective why we've been fighting tooth and nail with Brian's grace over the years yeah. and, and on top of that we recently had a meeting with them where they came in and uh, tried to give us a couple of bucks to drop it and go away which would not have helped at all uh, with the problems that we know exist in Brian's grace let alone the problems that are hidden under the surface under the dirt right now that we don't know about that may pop up a little later so we've like you said we've dug our hills in we're not going to just accept it and move on uh, we're, that's not the way business is going to be done here anymore and we're not going to be taken advantage of uh, we're not going to have our town you know just be a problem that everybody wants to avoid because my lord look at rising sun and all the trouble they have and i don't want to buy a house there i don't want to start a business there they have nothing but trouble that that's not us and that's not what we're going to be it's going to be a community that's built strongly, not only its infrastructure, its, its citizens, its business community. Uh, it, it's on an upward turn now, and we're going to keep it that way. And as well as bringing in, you know, a new water line, having a new sewer plant, having new parks being built that we've had built. Our dog park is a model for other communities right now. Uh, you know, we're, we're making a big turn here. It's not business as usual anymore. So once again, uh, Ryan Drive residents, bear with us. We haven't forgot about you. And uh, you have my email anytime you want to drop me a line. And the existing list that I started compiling last summer, uh, we still have. It's been turned over to KCI when they started going out and, and inspecting all the communities. 
all the problems we have down in Valley View, uh, as well as the other areas of town. If you start following the pattern, all I'm saying, folks, is look at it. Look at the big picture and then funnel it down to see where it starts. And it all has a central point, uh, the problems in all these communities. And you can go out and speak to those that developer and let them know how you feel. If you don't mind and you're happy with it, open your wallet. We shouldn't have to. Uh, but if you've got a problem, speak out and let them know because uh, we've got to stop things like this. Commissioner Alton Reith, I wanted to ask really quickly uh, if I'm correct, you are going to send out a letter to all the residents of Ryan Drive. Yes. So yes, um, it's, you, it's we not. Will, we do have a letter I signed tonight that will be going out to all the residents of Ryan Drive to let them know, you know what happened there, what was the cause, uh, what it was the, you know, what we've done to this point, and what we're going to be doing. Uh, they're going to get that hand delivered over the next couple of days, <clears throat> so that they will know what's going on and, and what we plan to do to it, and they can feel free to contact me also. Uh, after, and in, after in the short letter. term, we plan to clean the area, put a patch on, and then probably in the May area, April, May. We'll right. As soon as this soggy around. weather, all this snow that's uh, melting and creating the, the soft spots, we got a lot of ground getting ready to thaw. We're in a big transition point right now, weather wise, with, uh, you know, as cold as it's been. And then all of a sudden, boom, past couple of days, we've been in, you know, 40s and 50s. Uh, some other things could happen. You know, Murphy's Law, if it can happen, it will. You know, if it can go wrong, it will. So, like you said, we are going to go up there. There's, a, I understand, a big pile of dirt up there right now that's in, in the way. It's a real mess up there. I, I understand their frustration. So, but we're going to get back up there. The same gentleman that came in there and worked tirelessly till it was found and fixed are going to be back there to fix it right. And like I said, this summer you're going to, the road is going to be beautiful. It's going to kind of stop us from going to some other places and fixing some areas of the road that we knew had problems. But this, as you can see, has really turned into a big headache for us, and it, it deserves to be fixed right. The only thing I wanted to add uh, to Commissioner Alton Reese's comments is um, we all want new residents to come to our town. We want new business uh, to come to our town. Uh, we're willing to work with developers to come here, but we want to make sure that things are done right and that we don't repeat uh, a bad history that we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, so with that said, um, is there any more business to come before the board this evening? I just add with what you said, I mean, with what Commissioner Authory said, I mean, that was one of the things during our time on planning and zoning was that, I mean, I, I remember some of those conversations, that's not, you know, not how we used to do things. And now we're seeing what the consequences are of, of the way that some of those people that said that used to do things. Right. So, right. um, you know, and it's unacceptable. So, anyway. Can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? Move we adjourn. I second. All in oh, favor? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was late, but I would like to make a comment. Okay. Citizens input, go ahead. Please. Yep. Thank you. Joanne Osborne. I want to address the fact that uh, the post office is uh, telling us that without our post office box on our mail, they will return the mail to sender. Uh, many places that I deal with uh, will not send me anything unless I have my street address on it, even though it will end up in the mailbox. Uh, and my question is, why are those of us who live in Old Town, the original part of town, being discriminated against on mail delivery? Rising Sun is too small to have mail delivery within the town limits. However, as I drive around the town limits, within the town limits, we have numerous households that have mailboxes. So I'm wondering why the town allows mailboxes when we're too small to have in-town delivery, but anybody who lives in a place that can stick out a mailbox gets rural free delivery not those of us who live in the old part of town who have sidewalks that eliminate the accessibility of a mail carrier driving along. But right down from the post office, next few houses down, your development has mailboxes. Uh, the street behind me has mailboxes. Ryan Drive has mailboxes. Bet Brian's Grace has mailboxes. 
I'll bet the little development that just went in down the street from me has mailboxes. Why is Rising Sun too small to have in-town mail delivery if everybody who lives where you can plunk a mailbox down gets in-town mail delivery? That's my question, and can the town do something about it, either negotiating with the post office or simply telling residents of the town if n not everybody gets mail delivery, nobody gets mail delivery. You all have to go to the post office. I would think then the post office would say, oh my, yes, I think you're much bigger than Port Deposit. I think we really could deliver mail in town. That's my, my uh, contribution for tonight, and I do want to thank also our crew for uh, taking care of the water. I mean, it that was gushing down the street and um, clearing the snow. They really did work hard, and I appreciate it. And I've appreciated reading the mail, the uh, hmm, reviews of the past meetings, even though I haven't been here. So thank you very much. Thank you. If I may, Mayor, I want to thank you for bringing that up. I also live in a section of town where I do not get home delivery. And I, get, I don't get mail sometimes if my post office box number is not on it. They won't deliver put that piece of mail in my post office box that says 24 Mount Street. It has to say my post office box number. And I don't think that is, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. We need, we need to try to, to do something if we can. And I agree with George and her because most of the time, I said someplace, somewhere, I got a stack of mail this high because they just don't deliver. I've asked the people, <coughs> that I owe Phil for, uh, to send me statements. I do. What's your address? This is my address? Yes, I send it. I don't get it. I mean, it's been a constant problem and cost me a lot of extra money because they charge you late fees. And I keep telling them I failed my reading class and I don't know when they're due. But they, you know. <laughs> but it's becoming yeah. a big problem. It used to be one of the best. But now it's one of the worst. Since the postmaster Yep, it's been one of the worst in the country, I think. I definitely think that that's something that we can look into. I appreciate it's, that. Yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, we don't deliver the mail and, and uh, we don't determine who gets mailboxes, but I think we can work with the post office and see what What do you think would happen if I stuck a mailbox <laughs> out in my front yard? <laughs> huh? I think they'd drive right past it. They, they'd <laughs> say, where's that street at? <laughs> Sally Teague lived down on Wilson Avenue. She stuck a mailbox out there at the, on the at the edge of the macadam and they delivered the mail to her wow. think about that <laughs> all right can i get I a we adjourn okay <laughs> yeah. a second I, it's been moved and seconded all in favor uh, aye. aye meeting adjourned 803.